Hello, Kings, Queens, Nerds, and Geeks, Powder Milk here, and welcome back to another episode of Fall Equestria. Now, guys, I've re redone this recording because I realized I was in the wrong chapter, and I had to go back. Luckily, I don't remember what the fuck what the fuck was said in the last chap in that chapter anyway. So, anyway, we're in chapter thirty nine, the coming storm, part one. Now, um, guys, if you notice, there was a little change in the background here. Now. This is going to be because you've probably seen a previous video of mine. You probably already know where that's from. If not, I'm going to tell you now. Tell you all this stuff is from previous videos. Well, sort of. This here is my plushies. I decided to put them here because they're really cool. And uh, you know, these are all my favorite plushies. And also, if you notice this piece of awesome artwork right here, that's my wife had awesomely drawn uh, th of me and my three, three of my two ooh, least favorite people. We got me, of course, right in the center. And then there's Banana Man, that weird, crazy guy who literally thinks he's a banana. I don't know why, please. You've probably seen his video in a previous video. Uh, you might have seen him in previous videos. And I do not know why he took control of my computer. Also, if you recognize Sour Milk from ha around the ha from Halloween, that he kidnapped me for some reason. I, I don't know what... Uh, don't ask how I got away. I don't want to talk about it. Anyway... And uh, this video is if you've watched my face mask video, uh, I would like to know your guys' views on that. So, well, anyway, off to since we're off top, I'm getting off topic, but we're back to Fall of Equestria, and today is cha and chapter thirty nine, the coming storm part one, and I'm curious to what happens because Little Pit was caught in a in a in the in the in the bomb, and I want to know what happened. So here we go. Let's get right to it, shall we? Let's stop babbling. And I am cold, by the way, because it's snowing. Souls. Souls are the spirit and essence of a pony, the fundamental core of their nature, and the kernel of life that exists beyond the biology of flesh and blood and mental synapses. I had seen empirical evidence of the reality of souls. Beyond that, my beliefs in an afterlife where the souls of dead ponies continued on in eternal peace, and in the transcendent souls of Celestia and Luna as goddesses who watched over us with love and pity and hope. These surpassed the foundations of knowledge and were the architecture of faith. But there were two things I knew with absolute certainty. Souls had a living power, and a soul was a hard thing to kill. There was no way I could know for sure if the Black Book had been destroyed, but if it was not, then it was either buried under rubble or fused into a crater of glass. The Black Book hadn't needed to be the conduit of some eldritch cosmic horror, or its pages filled with blasphemous magic to corrupt those close to it. It was enough that the book was the host to a wicked and twisted soul, the soul of an insane and maleficent zebra. The Black Book called out to those around it who were susceptible to its influence. Two alicorns walked into the throne room. One sensed the presence of the Black Book, the other did not. Calamity had not reacted to it when I had found it. My other friends had been near it as they traveled with me. But it had sunk its barbed hooks into my mind, even before I had retrieved it. We had encountered two alicorns who had been affected by the temptations of the Black Book, without ever having seen or opened its pages. Nightseer had been transformed by the book's proximity. She had been one of those who the goddess had sent to find the book. Did her telepathy leave her especially defenseless? Had the black book filled the void in her mind left by the absence of the goddess? I was vulnerable to it. My weaknesses, addiction, curiosity, and the shame of only having a single spell, all played to its strength. Hmm. I'm seeing the black book as a salesman. Now guys, now, now get bear with me on this. I'm seeing the black book as a salesman, trying to poke at your prods and weaknesses. The way, uh, using his slick tongue, trying to get into your mind, trying to get you to buy in, give in to what he is offering. I know the feeling because I've done stuff like this before, which I'm not proud of. But it was ways of getting things to get my way. Now, 
Every, um, people, most people would use this in bad ways. Some people would use it in good ways. Like, you know, to get food for their family. Or trying to get a better deal on a car. Or, and this, and vice versa. Them trying to get money out of you to buy this car. Um, stuff like that. Is, um, is what people normally do. That's why. That's how I see the black book. It was poking and prodding at all of little Pip's weaknesses. The fact she only knows one spell, her addictions. The, the fact that she need, wants to be stronger for her friends, like anyone would. Do you want to be stronger for your friends? And that's that. So, anyway. Back to it. Thanks. The soul of the black book had been particularly ancient and powerful. I had possessed the black book for less than two days, and it had already begun to tempt me. Clumsily, perhaps, at first. The book wasn't telepathic like the goddess. Most of the horrors in my nightmare I had provided myself. The book merely used the tools my fevered night terrors gave it. And still, I did not have the strength alone to withstand its first probing attacks. To be able to stand against that influence as it continuously tried to erode you away, to hold on to any part of yourself after years with the book, much less to take its twisted gifts and create something noble and good from them. That would take a level of moral endurance and fortitude almost beyond comprehension. Be unwavering. How often had those six ponies from the past, through the radiance of their souls, given me insights I couldn't have had myself, or allowed me to tap reserves of strength and will that I shouldn't have been able to muster? They had saved and guided me since finding Applejack and Old Appaloosa, their influence growing with each statuette I found. But it was only after I had brought them all together that they had been able to intervene on my behalf more directly. I believe it was no coincidence that Rarity was the first to appear. My mind and soul had ever so briefly become the battleground for two warring influences, one powerful soul of evil and madness against six shards that shone with the virtue of hope of Rarity and her five closest friends. The shards of the statuettes were not truly those of the Ministry Mares. I suppose they were more like Rarity's soul wearing perfect disguises. But they shone with the true nature of those other ponies. They burned with the love and compassion and virtue and nobility of each of the Ministry Mares in turn. Hmm. They were... Interesting. So, my, uh, my theory is on those statues. Um, when making the spells, see, uh, a soul jar... I believe, which was made of the shards of her soul, were, which were, this, the soul could basically amplify any spell, basically. It would be able to continue, put it on a continuous point. The way Rarity did it was so that way her friends could, like, be represented in each of these. She put, like, a spell, like, a charm, in a way, to put a spectrum in things. Like, I, like, think of a video game. Like, you have an enchanted item. If you wear it, it gives you, like, plus five intelligence or plus three strength. That's basically the idea of these items. You equip them in your items, and they give you a bonus thing. It's kind of like, kind of like wearing the utility barding, which the utility barding in uh, Fallout games uh, to help help you, um, well, not utility barding, but the utility fault suit which allows you to have more intelligence and repair and more uh, repair and stuff. That's basically the same concept with the with these things. I'm like I'm putting video game logic. I've been playing a lot of video games lately. Sorry. <laughs> or eternal metaphysical images of the deepest, truest nature of those ponies, lit up like beacons, fueled by a shining piece of rarity herself. Rarity, whose magical talent had always been in the shadow of Twilight Sparkle must have seemed like easy prey to the zebra soul within the black book. It had been wrong. She was one of the bearers of the elements of harmony for a reason, and when the soul images of the ministry mares were brought together, they brought the inner fire that fuels the elements of harmony with them. They had proven more powerful, even as mere shards, than the whole soul residing in the book, or at least powerful enough to give me the strength I needed to fend it off. If the Black Book could not stand against the gestalt of the Ministry Mare's souls when they were merely shards, how could it have stood against the whole soul of Twilight Sparkle, combined in unity with three of the most magically powerful mares of her time? 
The Black Book was not telepathic, but it could sense souls around it, knowing instinctively whom it could manipulate, and whom it could not. That last temptation of the book had an air of desperation to it. The zebra soul had no way of knowing I was about to destroy its soul jar. It had been reacting to something else. The Black Book had sensed the goddess, and it had been afraid. What happens to a soul when it no longer has a body to hold it? Does it truly transcend? Does it spread out, no longer contained, like the hydrogen in a balloon that has been popped, until it is no longer truly a soul, indistinguishable from the environment? I guess that depends on what you believe. This is where religion's in place. I like how I'm talking more in this one, ever. Because it's giving me things to talk about. Like... What happens to a soul when it's gone? Me, I believe there's a soul. It's what's making... It's not... But not the actual physical soul. I believe it's what an imprint of what your life is like. What a pr imprint of who you are. That's what I think a soul is. I don't personally believe that there's anything out there. I don't believe you go anywhere. I just think you live, you die, and go. But in this world, this is a different universe. There could be an afterlife in this universe. Yet again, we don't know what would happen to a zebra who invented this book. Is there, is there a heaven and hell or some form? I know Tartarus is a place you could go. Hell. Uh, Celestia and them locked them away and locked people away there. Hey, look at uh, Tyrek. He's, he's locked away there. I wonder if he's still there. Yet again, this is before season three. So, uh, you gotta remember that. So, anyway, back. Environment. What of the souls trapped together in the horror that was the goddess? My goal had been to destroy the physical reality of the goddess and free the souls trapped inside. To allow Twilight Sparkle, Trixie, and the others the rest they deserved and had been denied. I had not expected the goddess to try to save her children, but I had not expected the impact of the six memory orbs either. By showing those memories to the goddess, I had awoken something in Trixie. The goddess had become lost, and I believe part of her was able to find herself in those memories. The star orb had been created for comparison. By showing that memory to the goddess, I had acted like Rarity's mirror had for Pinkie Pie. Just like I had hoped the memories of the balloon orb might stir whatever still remained of Twilight Sparkle. And what of my own soul? If I had died here, would Celestia and Luna welcome me, or turn me away in horror and disgust? I knew what I had done, and my soul was blackened from it. I had finally taken that step off the cliff. I had sacrificed my own morality and goodness to save the equestrian wasteland. I was red-eye now, through and through, and there would be a price to pay for that. Thirty-eight minutes would have been plenty of time, but that time was never meant for me. It was time enough for Zenith and Calamity to escape. I had been willing to forfeit my own life. Thirty-eight minutes would have been enough for the alicorns of the goddess to have scoured Mariponi, found the bomb, and disarmed whatever timer Red Eye had constructed for it. But the Balefire bomb had never been in Mariponi. Thirty-eight minutes was not long enough for the alicorns to have fought their way through the maze of Hellhound Warrens and find the bomb hidden dozens of yards beneath Mariponi's foundations. The Balefire bomb had gone off in a subterranean detonation directly beneath us. I awoke in pitch darkness. I felt sick, even worse than in days past. My body was hot. My mouth was dry. My stomach was twisted painfully, but there was nothing in it to heave. My body was covered in sweat. There was a crushing weight on my lower body that brought back memories of a nightmare, being trapped under a wall, crying out while I watched Calamity and Velvet Remedy walk away. There was a hiss from the darkness below. The floor beneath me slanted away. I would have slid down into that hissing blackness, but I was pinned. My pit buck was clicking slowly. For a few terrifying minutes, I had no idea where I was. Then, I remembered the bomb. 
remembered running for the safe room, bucking the emergency button. I didn't recall a whole lot after that. My memories were jumbled. But I did remember feeling the almighty thwomp from somewhere underneath of us. The feeling of the whole room being thrust upwards as the bomb annihilated everything above it. A brief moment of weightlessness and the rush of falling. Click. Click. I turned on my eyes toward Sparkle, wondering when I had turned it off. A dozen warnings flashed across it. The safe room had survived two megaspells, one almost point-blank. But there was a microfracture somewhere in its protective walls, and radiation was leaking in. Considering how hot it must be outside, the fact that I was alive and the room wasn't an unbearable oven spoke amazing praise of Twilight and her ministry. Good job, Twilight! But I was swiftly reaching fatal levels of exposure. I floated a rat away from my saddlebags, bracing against the horrid taste. According to my inventory sorter, the other medical supplies I had packed, several healing potions and a vial of Zenith's bleeding stopper goop, were all gone. I had been conscious before, but I had no recollection of it. The magic of the safe room must have prevented me from being turned to pace by the concussive force of the blast alone. Even still, with the fall I must have taken, I was lucky I didn't break my neck. Or anything else. According to my EFS, I was remarkably unbattered. For a mare who was dying. Wait. Hadn't there been some pony else in here with me? Peering into the darkness, I tried to remember. My EFS compass was telling me I was alone. I lifted my pip leg and turned on the light. Merciful goddesses. My pit buck light shone down a room, tilted at an insane angle. The terminal bank had torn from the wall. The concrete of the ceiling had collapsed in, revealing the shiny purple-tinted metal above it. A large slab of concrete lay across me, pinning me in place. Below, the lower third of the room was filled with discolored water, rubble, and the mangled filing cabinet. A small spray was coming from a section in the wall which had torn open. Something floated in the dark pool beneath me. Well, it was of a more spacious coffin than the healing booth, but I had been foolish to think this room would save me. I was trapped, locked inside. And even if I could escape, outside was instant death. I'm out of food and the safe room's water talisman seems to have been corrupted, Twilight had said. At least I'm fairly certain that pure water isn't supposed to be that color. The water talisman was tainted. The body of what had once been Ambrosia was beneath that water. Mostly. Her body had bulged and metastasized under the taint, straining against the armor. A blob of malformed flesh had pushed out through the open visor like a tongue. A fleshy, grotesquely misshapen worm floated on the surface of the water. I screamed as I realized it was one of my hind legs. After several long minutes of terror, I realized I could feel both of my hind legs. Barely able to breathe, I shifted my light, trying to look under the slab that was crushing me. Both my hind legs were there, intact and healthy, except one was the pink of exposed skin with only a light fuzz of a coat. I had lost my leg in the fall, and I had regrown it. I didn't think it was possible to feel any sicker, but I did. A Wait, deep, what? soul-aching horror filled me as I realized that I wasn't even a pony anymore. I was something else. I wanted to cry, to scream. Was I a ghoul? Wait a minute. You're telling me little Pip regrew her leg. Is this part of the mutation of the taint from before? What? Think about it. Think about this, guys. Ah, uh, wait, I just took my thing on. You probably can't hear me. Hold on. Think about this for a moment. Here, this will make it easier. Think about this for a moment. Imagine. I, and you gotta remember, she was tainted at one point. And she felt that. And she had to get rid of that taint. And they did say that there was a slight mutation. Now, that my theory is, is that slight mutation made her the gave her the ability to regrow limbs. Who knows how long she's been passed out. So we're about to find out 
what it is. I'm determined, and I want to know how the fuck that happened. I am more intrigued than ever, guys. I am... This story is giving... It's continuously giving more, me more questions than I want to know. Just like the game Fallout does. Because, guys, I've been playing that game a lot more lately, and I've just been wanting to know more and more and more. By the way, guys, check out Oxhorn. He's got some pretty awesome videos. That's who I've been watching to see these theories and theories and lore breakdowns, which is pretty awesome. So I don't know if you guys watch Oxhorn, but he's pretty cool. O X H O R N. So transformed by the bomb, or was this from my exposure to the taint? How far removed was I now from becoming one of the goddess's children? At least the radiation would kill me before the room filled enough for me to drown. Unless I was enough of a pseudo-alicorn that the radiation wouldn't kill me. I prayed that it was. Please, please, Celestia, I beg you, have mercy on me. I turned off my light. It was better not seeing. Something wrenched the safe room. The concrete slab scraped against me as it shifted, drawing blood. The wounds were already closing as I tried to brace myself, worried that this lab might slide off. Then, I felt the whole room lift, soaring into the air. The tainted water washed over me as the room righted itself. The misshapen flesh blob that had once been my leg washed up against me. I screamed in horror at the slimy touch of my desecrated former flesh. God. A violent grinding filled the air, and the metal shutters over the windows pulled away revealing a purple-tinted sky of clouds filled with blowing ash. The armored glass shattered, the razor-sharp shards hovering and then whisking away. My pit buck began to click rapidly. Oh, shit. Somewhere above, I spotted the dark silhouette of a wagon and a glowing light of green and gold. For a moment, I thought it was pyrolite. But then I realized the glow was coming from a pegasus. Had my friends come to rescue me? How? And at what cost? Oh, calamity, I thought, weeping without tears. No, 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 no. What have you done? But something was wrong. A purple glow enveloped me, a second floating the slab off my leg as I was levitated out through the obliterated window. The super alicorn, her coat a dark purple to the point of black, stared at me with glowing eyes as she casually tossed away the safe room, performing telekinesis that would have overstrained me with effortless ease. The clouds above seemed awfully close. I glanced downward. We were very, very high. Below, the second crater of Splendid Valley glowed in the aftermath. With a beat of her wings, she flew up level with the wagon above us, bringing me with her. I realized at once that the wagon was not the Sky Bandit, and that the glowing Pegasus was not Calamity. Did he do? The super-irradiated ghoul grinned happily at me, a sickly golden-green light emanating from her mouth and around- You told me- oh, so, okay, okay, I'm gonna guess that Ditsy Doo got caught in the bomb, again, and became a glowing one. Her teeth. The creatures of radiation do not merely heal in its presence. If they absorb enough of it, they grow stronger, more powerful. Ditsy Doo had come into Splendid Valley looking for me. She had saved me. She and... The Super Alicorn set me on the front bench of the Absolutely Everything delivery wagon, right behind its view. Without the glow of her magic, the purple tint vanished from the sky, traded for a sickly green. Purple. Purple. If that's what I think it is. My pit buck's clicking went insane. We were high enough above the crater for the radiation levels to be merely bad, but Ditsy Doo was shedding enough radiation to make this a very short rescue. The glowing ghoul smiled and pointed back at the wagon. I turned around, looking in through a small window. Inside the wagon were crates of Rataway, the packets glowing an inviting orange. I quickly levitated several and began to drink, turning back to thank her. I stopped as my eyes caught on the cutie mark on the super alicorn's flank. A large pink star surrounded by smaller white ones. 
The Super Alicorn was silent, impassive. Oh my battle. god! Twilight lives! Sorry, I had to scream. I had to go scream. Okay. Oh. I was struck by a flash of insight. The goddess had sent her children away, but she was telepathic, maintaining contact with them. When her body was destroyed, and the souls of the countless ponies who had been consumed in her were set free, some of them, the strongest ones, found their way into the bodies of her fleeing children. Possession. But those bodies already had souls of their own. It was unlikely this could last. Already, the cutie mark on the super alicorn was beginning to fade. I scrambled. If this was Twilight Sparkle in any way, there was something she needed to hear. I turned up the volume on my ear bloom and levitated it towards her as I found the file. The voice of Pinkie Pie, tinny and distorted, crackled through the air. Hi, Twilight. It's me. I mean, I have you with me now, so you'll kind of be with me anyway. But it's not the same. I want the real Twilight Sparkle. I... I want my friend back. Please? I'll do anything. The Super Alicorn had hovered, seeming transfixed by the sound until the message ended. Then, wordlessly, she turned and began to fly away. The cutie mark on her flank was already completely gone. Twilight, wait! I cried out after the disappearing Alicorn. Star Sparkle is still alive! And Spike! But whatever part of Twilight Sparkle my words might have once been able to reach were now gone. Evaporated. God damn it! Or, if my heart could just hope, asleep. I wanted to cry, but my body couldn't produce tears. I drank another one of those horrid rataways as Ditsy Doo turned and began flying us out of Splendid Valley. Ditsy Doo brought the wagon low as we reached the edge of the valley. We began flying along the border, moving slowly. We were searching for something. I wanted to ask what, but Ditsy Doo couldn't speak. What did you do? What did you just do? The voice of Ambrosia fluttered through my mind. I fought to remember. I told her about the bomb. I was sure of that. I couldn't recall exactly what I had said, but an antsy mare with a magical energy battle saddle didn't exactly engender a desire to lie. Her response had been to try to call Harbinger through the broadcaster built into her helmet. The room is designed to stop mega spells. I recall telling her. Your radio isn't going to penetrate. She had looked at me with panic. I have to tell Harbinger. He has to get out of here. We have to pull back. Her words had sparked a burst of fear in my breast. How many ponies do you have outside? The ground passed slowly beneath us. I couldn't remember any more. I caught them on my eyes forward sparkle friendly lights appearing on my EFS compass before I actually spotted my friends. As we approached the clearing not far from the devastated Red Eye camp, Steelhoves appeared, pulling camouflage netting off of the Sky Bandit. Velvet Remedy, Zenith, and Calamity emerged from within. They all looked worn, weary, and bedraggled. Calamity immediately took to the air, while Velvet and Zenith scanned the skies. Pyrelite was oddly absent from the group. Did you find anything this time? My Pegasus friend shouted. I tried to jump up, but my body just didn't have the energy, so instead I waved. He couldn't see me anyway. Ditsy Doo was just too bright. Ditsy Doo flew us in closer, 
pulling up and hovering at the edge of the clearing. I downed yet another rat away as she waved Calamity back. I felt weak, sick, and half dead. My body was alien to me. I wasn't me anymore. But all of that paled in comparison to the wash of joy at the impending reunion. I needed to get to Tempony Tower, get cleansed of the taint I had suffered, assess what was left of me, and, if homage would still have me, spend a forever with her and my friends. A short forever, unfortunately. I had cleared the way for Red Eye to ascend, and he had a host of unicorns he planned to sacrifice in the process. With the threats of the goddess and the black book taken care of, I now had a new quest before me to brave the Everfree Forest and rescue those unicorns from Red Eye's Cathedral. I probably didn't have a lot of time. Now that Red Eye couldn't count on Alicorns for protection anymore, he would likely act fast. But I was in no shape to fight a Radroach, much less infiltrate a stronghold. My body was weeping for me to give it care and rest. It would be possible to push myself further until I had done so. Hey! Hey, it's Little Pip! Calamity shouted enthusiastically. Hey, Everett Pony! Ditsy's brought back Little Pip! She's alive! Velvet Remedy and Zenith began to stomp in applause. Velvet gave out a thankful shout. Steela's whinnied. Thank Applejack. He turned to the others. Okay, let's get out of here. I don't like being in one place too long, especially this close to... The ground erupted. Fountains of dirt burst into the air as half a dozen hellhounds tore themselves out of the ground. Ditsy Doo pulled up as one of them swung a magical energy rifle around and fired at us. Velvet Remedy let out a scream. Calamity spun in the air, kicking the lever of his battle saddle, switching his ammo. One of the hellhounds closed on Zenith, taking a swipe. The zebra ducked, turning and bucking the hellhound in the chest, dropping it. Steelers began to fire his grenade machine gun tearing apart one of the hellhounds as she aimed a multi-gem magic- Sudden realization that each of these characters have, like, a specific player type. Each player has- everybody has a different player type, right? In the game. Me, I'm more of a, you know, shoot first, ask questions later, or kind of like Calamity. I'm kind of like Calamity when it comes to games. I shoot first, ask questions later. And, um, there are the healer types, like Velvet. Um, and of course, there are people who actually like to be skilled in arm unarmed combat. That's very rare in gamers, but it does happen. You know, stealth kills. I'm also that kind of gamer. I either am either full frontal or I'm stealth. That's the, There's no in-between. But that's how it is. But that's, I'm basically like Zenith and Calamity put together, but I'm only one at, one at a time, you know? And my camera keeps unfocusing. Okay, it's focused. Okay. Magical shotgun towards Velvet and Zenith. Get to the wagon! Calamity shouted as he took a shot, staggering a hellhound who was trying to climb into the Sky Bandit. The earth beneath Steelhose blasted upwards as a hellhound lashed up out of the ground. The hellhound's claw slashed in a long arc, slicing through Steelhose's armor. Steelhose's armored body fell to the broken ground with a heavy thud. His armored head rolled a few yards away. The world what? stopped. The battle still raged, what? but it was someplace far away. All the color and sound seemed to mute, leaving just me, no! the beating of my heart, and the slow rocking of Stilo's head. Stilo's was dead. A cold, wet chill ran down my body. There was no coming back from that. I'd seen Zenith decapitate a canterlot zebra. But the little pony in my head was shaking in denial. No. No, she insisted. There will be an ugly warping sound, and he'll be right back with us, just like always. Steelhose was dead. I couldn't move. Couldn't feel. Couldn't breathe. My mind was locked up. The gears jammed. No! No! The weren't going to give me a moment to process. No! Much less grieve. The hellhound who killed Steelhoof stepped forward, skewered his claws through Steelhoof's helmet, then spun and hurled the armored head of my companion, trying to knock us out of the sky. Ditsy-Doo dodged, and Steelhoof's head slammed against her wagon next to me, splintering wood. 
The impact cracked his helmet's headlamp. Something snapped inside of me. My horn burst with light, layer upon layer of overglow, brighter than even Ditsy do. The hellhounds were surrounded with light as they shot upwards into the sky, all of them, higher and higher until they were nothing but dark specks. Then they weren't visible at all. Steel hooves! Velvet screamed, dashing to the fallen headless body and wrapping it in her forelegs. All the others turned, eyes wide as they realized we had lost one of our own. Thud. The ground shook as the first hellhound fell out of the sky. The mangled, broken body oozed on the ground. Seconds later, the rest of the hellhounds joined their companion on the ground. Do you even know what Balefire is? Another flash of memory tugged at me as we approached New Appaloosa. We were flying low, moving quickly. Zenith stood on the sky bandit, watching the clouds. I got the impression we should be walking, but my condition was far too severe for me to even try the journey. Ain't safe to fly no more, Calamity called out to me, flying as close as he could to the absolutely everything wagon without suffering ditzy exposure. Damn enclave have patrols everywhere, and anything airborne tends to catch their attention. Not that the sky bandit exactly has a low profile, considering our cloud breach last month. We just couldn't catch a break, could we? You sure it was Arbinger you saw back in Maripony? Calamity asked as we began to slow. That's who he said he was, I called back, hating how much effort it took to shout. Damn. I figured this had to be big when a whole regiment of the Enclave descended on Maripony. Zenith and I barely made it out of there. But you're telling me we blew up a member of the Enclave High Council. I could use one of your creative swears about now, little pip. Calamity frowned. Congratulations. We just declared war on the Enclave. Ouch. But even as I grimaced, I realized that the Enclave had shown up knowing that Red Eye was plotting against the Goddess. If anything, they would suspect he had been behind the bomb, and I had been his agent. Which, on a very real level, was absolutely accurate. From the Enclave's perspective, Red Eye had just declared war. I could see Pyrelet circling above the city, a single bird of prey. She let out a hoot as the two wagons landed, Ditsy Doo setting down a little distance from the sky wagon. Pyrelet dove out of the air, disappearing into the town. Maybe he got out? I offered weakly. Now, so far as I know, I know Little Pip has been, you know, physically changed and all. In multiple ways, she has the the Pip boy, the Pip little, uh, the Pip buck, fused to her arm now. But now she can regrow limbs, which is interesting. So what does that mean? But the one thing they didn't notice is that no one has ever said anything. Has Little Pip had any other than the other than the the four four leg thing? Um, What, is there any other, like, appearance changes? I don't know. I think after this video, I'm going to change the little background you guys see, so... Now that things have changed. Yeah, not much chance of that. Calamity called back. Mom, the alicorns are clear. A huge alicorn shield wrapped her all around Mary Pony. I reckon she was trying to trap you inside with her. No pony got out of there. Or maybe she was trying to contain the blast, to protect her fleeing children. With a shield that powerful, generated by the god herself, the only thing that would get out through it was her telepathy. Until the second that bomb killed her. That was, assuming she didn't realize that the bomb wasn't within her shield. In truth, the Balefire bomb was planted far enough beneath the facility that it was very well possible that it could have been outside of her shield. And if she had expected that, Maybe she was trying to save herself. Either way, it didn't matter. The mega spell augmented bale fire had proven greater than the goddess's power. It's magical fire, I had offered, answering Ambrosia, even as I realized I really didn't know what bale fire was, other than green and radioactive. It's bottled necromancy and hats dragon's breath, Ambrosia had told me. 
the magical disintegrative type of dragon's breath that can send you someplace else. In the case of Balefire, probably straight to hell. Based on the possession of the Super Alicorn, who had probably been a normal Alicorn until Twilight Sparkle flew around the new crater in Splendid Valley, searching for survivors. Ambrose's guess was almost certainly wrong. But the concept was still chilling. Something Rarity had said struck me. I even tried to have Spike burn it. All that did was send it to Princess Celestia. I remembered thinking of Spike roasting an enclave pony inside her armor. It was horrid and sickening to witness. But I felt a little better about it if I could imagine he was sending her soul straight to Celestia. Which led to the hurting reality of the body being carried inside of the Sky Bandit. Should we have Steels cremated? Would Spike be willing? We can't stay here, Calamity said, the normal cheer gone from his voice. He looked at Ditsy Doo. None of us. Ditsy Doo nodded sadly. She dropped one of her chalkboards and wrote on it. Is this permanent? Nah, I reckon it should bleed off just like when Pyrelet soaked up in the Philadelphia crater, Calamity assured her. But Pyrelet took days to return to normal, Velvet Remedy reminded them. Her eyes were still wet and puffy with tears. She had been riding with Steelhoof's body and head, keeping watch over it. And Dizzy Doo had taken far more radiation than Pyrelet did. It could take weeks. The sweet ghoul mare looked panicked. She quickly erased her chalkboard and wrote, Silver Bell, in large letters. Velvet Remedy nodded, smiling sadly. I'll stay here and watch over her for you. You can't, I said, speaking up finally. We're not allowed inside of town. Zenith looked up in surprise. We are not, she asked, her exotic voice betraying her own depression. When did we offend this town? It was before your time, Calamity said. Back when it was just Little Pip, Velvet, and me. Well, then I am not barred, it would seem, Zenith asserted. Turning to Ditsy Doo, she too smiled gently. It would be a pleasure to watch Silverbell for you while you have to be away. Ditsy Doo forgot herself, swooping up to the zebra and giving Zenith a twite, albeit squishy, hug. Zenith stiffened but bit back any response. The ghoul pegasus swiftly backed away, writing sorry on her chalkboard. Hey, look, Ditsy, Calamity offered. I might know where you could get some help. There's a mare up in Friendship City who's been researching radiation and its effects on creatures. If any pony can help you shed this off quicker, it'll be her. Ditsy smiled brightly, one of her eyes rolling upward as she visibly fought her urge to hug Calamity right now. Why don't you travel with us for a spell? Calamity offered. Ain't safe to travel alone, and we're headed that way, ain't we, little Pip? Ten Pony Tower. I nodded realizing we couldn't cremate steel of his body. He wasn't ours. Fetlock first. We have to take Steel's back to Stable 29. The massive gate to New Appaloosa rumbled open. The Griffin bodyguard whom I had seen with Ditsy Doo before flew out, Silverbell scampering after him. Her eyes went wide as she saw Ditsy Doo. Mom, you look just like Pyrelite. The little lavender filly began to charge across the road between us, trying to reach her. Zenith swiftly caught her, holding her back. I heard Silverbell let out a frustrated scream as Zenith refused to let her pass. I also heard a strangled sound. I wasn't sure if it was from Velvet or from Ditsy Doo. The glowing Pegasus rubbed her hoof against her chalkboard, erasing Silverbell's name, and wrote something else before picking the chalkboard up again. Silverbell struggled against the restraining legs of Zenith and began to cry. Ditsy Doo trotted halfway to where Zenith was holding Silverbell, as close as she dared to get, and set the chalkboard down on the street. Stay away, love. Mommy's poison. The clouds had begun to darken, That's sad. threatening the equestrian wasteland with another storm. That's sad. Dark shadows moved. Silverbell thinks of her as mom. And she can't be near her. How do I give Ditsy... Um, second of all, I gotta give Ditsy props! 
Guys, I have a very deep love for step for step parents for reason because they took the depending on the step parent of course, they took the role that nobody else wanted. I, I my my mom, the one who passed away, you guys know of this, that she herself had uh, passed away, and it, it devastated me. Like I didn't know what to do. I I didn't know how I I had wished I had more time. In this situation, Silver Bell is a is not as much. It's a much more softer situation. But she can't be her mom, not because she's dead, but the fact that she's so irradiated, she won't be near her daughter for what long time. Just behind the surface of the clouds, as we watched, the shadows took the shape of great black warships descending beneath the cloud curtain. Each warship was a huge deployment hangar, and platforms are massive magical energy cannons flanked by black as thunderclouds and moving through the air on a dozen propellers. Through my binoculars, I could barely make out the swarms of black dots that were armored pegasi flying in formations between the warships. Raptors, Calamity announced grimly, watching as the warships descended lower, alternating course slightly. Like the Pridwin? Dragon killers. Okay, I know that in the old days they had the you know, the. I, I, I this is my remind me of the Pridwin. In um, this what they were describing is reminding me of the Pridwin from uh, Fallout Four. I think Fallout Three. I don't remember. Um, but the Pridwin was one of the flying machines that the Brotherhood of Steel had. I I know these are these are Steel Rangers. That's what their equivalent is. And the Enclave is the Fallout Three bad guys. I think it's been a long time since I've played Fallout Three and seen their bad guys. So. I allowed my magic to expire, dropping my binoculars onto the ground next to me. I was at a loss for an appropriately colorful metaphor at the moment. Anything involving Luna's horn now struck me as grievously inappropriate. My gaze found Ditsidu, the brightest point of light. She was enwrapped in a lead-lined cloak, something she had the griffin fetch from her shop. An old mailbag hung from her side, but her hooves, face, and wings still burned like an emerald furnace. I recalled something Almuch had said as DJ Pony, claiming a male pony had delivered a letter from Ditsidu. Beneath the anti-radiation barding Ditsidu had provided me, and my own barding beneath, my own coat was growing back over my hind leg. My new hind leg. Just thinking about that felt deeply wrong. I'd been drinking enough Radaway to purge most of the radiation from my system, even traveling in the back of the absolutely everything delivery wagon but I still felt weak and twisted up inside. We were just a hill back from Trixie's cottage. In theory, we had stopped for lunch, but no pony was eating. I couldn't stomach anything. Ditsy Doo didn't have to eat, and neither Velvet nor Calamity had an appetite. They'd both just stared at their cans of beans until Ditsy Doo trotted up, dropping her chalkboard which said, Your poor beans are getting all lonely. They want to be with their stomach friends. Calamity had chuckled and nibbled a little after that. Velvet Remini had just given me a sad smile. I drank another rat away. They've been coming down out of the sky like that the last two days, Calamity informed me. Ponies are freaking out, going into hiding. Whole damn wasteland feels like it's under martial law. He looked askance at me. They took over the broadcast this morning, both Red Eye and DJ Pony. Radio's now all enclave all the time. I put in my ear bloom and turned on my Pip Bucks radio, trying to ignore the squirming feeling in my insides. Instead of Amage's music or DJ Pony's voice, I caught the end of a Pegasus anthem. Greetings, ponies of Equestria. By now you've seen our ships in the enclave sky overhead. Is hell. Perhaps our Pegasi have even landed in your streets. But there is no need for alarm. Our scouts are merely assessing the current situation before we determine how best we can help you. I switched it off. I'd heard better propaganda from Red Eye. I'm trying not to doubt myself here, Calamity admitted. I left because I realized the Enclave never intended to rejoin the rest of Equestria. The Enclave wasn't interested in helping down here. Now I'm second-guessing a lot of things. They tried to make a deal with the Goddess, I told him. They aren't here to help. Yeah, Calamity said dourly. I didn't really figure they were. 
This is just a backup plan. Calamity started packing up the camouflage netting again. Where did you get that? I asked. Steel hooves. Calamity sighed. When the Enclave first appeared, he procured this from Crossroads. Said we needed to keep the Sky Bandit covered up whenever we weren't moving. I swallowed. I started to think of all the times Steelhoof had protected us. But I just ended up thinking about his voice. That deep masculine rumble, kind of like Flutter Guy's voice, Watcher had claimed. And how I'd never hear from him again. My eyes burned, wanting to cry. He was real good at that, Calamity said solemnly. Thinking tactically, you know? We shared a moment of silence. Minutes later, we were flying again. We'd been trying to keep low, but the terrain was about to make that difficult. Calamity winged upwards, gaining altitude as we passed over the ruins of Trixie's now cottage. Sad. Now I feel sad, guys. When I read stories, guys, I feel things on a personal level. I'm not reading, but I'm listening, but you get the idea. But when I read stories, play games, and I get to them close, on a per I feel these characters on a personal level. I feel like I something died to me inside when I find out they die. Like, example, completely unrelated. Death Note. For those of you who have ever watched Death Note, you know, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, L dies. When I watched him die, I cried. I couldn't stop crying. Now I want to cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. Back to the story. But the point is, I feel things at a personal level, and I feel the the more I feel remorse, and I feel like mourning over the character, even if they're not real. It just feels that way. I'm pretty sure some of you would agree. There were several Alcorns deck. standing around it. They didn't pay us more than a fleeting glance. If anything, I would have said they looked lost. Tomorrow, Crossroads told us. I blinked with surprise. We were in the security center of Stable 29. A somber air hung over the entire stable. Steelho's body had been taken into the Crusader mainframe room by an honor guard. Tomorrow, I asked, swaying lightly. My body felt so weak. My hooves wanted to rest. My mind was fogged, but I was fairly sure that the new acting elder's announcement was abnormal. Isn't that awfully fast? Star Pallet and Crossroads neighed. Every Steel Ranger outcast who will be able to make it is already here. Applejack's Rangers, Calamity spoke up. At Crossroads' querying look, Calamity explained, I know that ain't the official name, but that's how Steel Hills thought of y'all. Looking down at his hooves, he added, Shadonary, that's all I'm saying. The brown mare with the cropped yellow mane nodded. As I said, all of the Applejack's rangers who will be able to attend the Elder's funeral are already here. There is no delay. It would be unseemly to allow his body to go unburied. I imagine there were internal matters to address as well. Steelhoofs had been the leader and symbol that all these rangers had rallied around. With him gone, Crossroads had to act quickly to keep the rangers from falling apart. Every pony seemed to expect Crossroads to step into the role of elder. Many already acted as if she was. But I sensed there was still official protocol to be attended to. And Crossroads was not willing to take those steps while Steelhoofs remained unburied. Her love and respect for him were too much to allow that. Will you be able to attend? Wild manacles couldn't drag us away, Calamity said. I quickly offered a prayer to Luna that Calamity's words didn't beg prophecy. I nodded. I couldn't travel any more tonight if I wanted to. I smiled grimly. I was having trouble standing right now. We'll stay the night, so long as it's all right with you. And you have a place for Ditsy to stay safely. Crossroads smiled grimly. Your glowing friend. We can put her in one of the shielded rooms of maintenance, she explained. I'm not going to turn away some pony just because she's a ghoul, especially not on the eve of Steelhoof's funeral. 
but I can't have her trotting around the stable either. She's dangerous to those around her. I nodded. I knew Ditsy-Doo would understand. Where? Nope. And that was it. My legs decided that they were done with this standing thing and wanted to try something else. How about falling over? Yeah, that sounded pretty good. Thump. Little Pip, what's wrong? Calamity reared, his voice full of worry. I'm... I'm fine, I told him quickly. Floor's nice. I think I'll just stay down here for a little while. Crossroads stepped forward. What's wrong with her? Little Pip was in Splendid Valley when the mega spell went off. Calamity told her worriedly. She keeps breaking all the rules and surviving the impossible, and I think reality's starting to kick a tail for it. I'll have our medics, Crossroads was saying. I'm getting velvet, Calamity swore, turning and flying out of the room. I sighed. All this fuss. I just needed to rest for a little bit. Take a little nap. Dark gray clouds hung over the equestrian wasteland the next morning. A cold wind blew across the grass, bringing the scent of impending rain. Soft rumbles of thunder growled in the depths of the cloud curtain. Somewhere in the distance, the cracking booms of some sort of gunfire echoed across the landscape. We were gathered on the greens of rolling hills near Steelhoff's shack. The wind rippled the dark water of the lake. Behind us, Ditsy Doo stood near a single large tree on the hilltop. She had draped a large black sheet over her lead cloak, her glowing face and hooves shining out from under it. The ghoul Pegasus had somehow known to bring several such sheets. I sat in a wheelchair just up the hill from the rows of armor-clad rangers that flanked both sides of the procession. I had been up for a little over an hour. I had passed out on the floor of the security center and slept all night in the stable clinic. The rest had done me a world of good, but I still felt terrible. An alien in my own body. Velvet Remedy had washed me, hardly speaking a word the entire time. Then she insisted I attend the funeral off of my hooves. Calamity had created the black dresses for both Velvet and myself out of the additional sheets provided by Ditsy Doo, again demonstrating his freaky knowledge of sewing. The cloth matched the color of my heart. I was drowning in sorrow, but I still hadn't managed to cry. I felt like I was broken. The rangers on each side of the aisle stomped slowly in unison, a processional beat. Six rangers in ceremonial barding walked slowly down the cleared aisle, their mouths holding the rods that held up the platform upon which Steelhoof's body rested. I noticed that Strawberry Lemonade was one of the pallbearers. Tears were spilling from her eyes as she kept step with the larger stallions, walking Steelhoof's to the hole in the ground that would be his final resting place. Sunbony had welded Steelhoof's head back on. Somehow, that was what got me the most. My breath caught, then came out in shudders. My whole body began to tremble, racked with sobs. Velvet Remedy reached up hoof and held me gently. She had been crying softly since we left Stable 29, and most of the trip here yesterday. Now, she comforted me while the dam inside me broke. My eyes burned fiercely. I still had no tears but my whole body did what my eyes could not. Star Pouting Crossroads stepped forward as the pallbearers reached the pit. She began to say the words she had written the night before, words spoken on Steelho's behalf. Applejack's Rangers, Crossroads began. That's what Elder Steelho's called us. My mind had drifted as Crossroads spoke. I went back to when Steelho's first began traveling with us. So, why are you still with us? I had asked Steelhoofs. Maybe I have nothing better to do. Live through more than any of us could possibly imagine, Crossroads was saying. He survived more than we could fathom, and through the centuries his heart never strayed from his love and commitment for a single mare. I doubted him. He kept his motivations, like his feelings, close to his chest. I remembered with pain that there was a time I considered bucking him to the curb. 
I follow you because you're a better pony than I am. And you remind me of some pony else. You honestly strive to help and protect these ponies. I believe she would have approved of you. He'd said that when I called him into question. I haven't been faithful to my oath for a long time. But at your side, I can be again. Nothing more appropriate than to repeat the words he spoke to us all. Crossroads reminded the rangers gathered before her. In the words of Steelhoofs, I call on you to stop and consider your oath. Consider where you are and what you are doing. Your loyalties lie with Applejack, the mayor of the Ministry of Wartime Technology, the creator of the Steel Ranger armor, and the mayor who by her own hooves, the sweat of her brow and the honesty of her heart, forged the Steel Rangers. Another memory galloped on the hooves of the last. Steelhoofs and I staring out over the harbor, looking towards Friendship City. I need to thank you, little Pip. For what? I had asked. For failing, Steelhoofs had answered, surprising me. All this time, you've been some pony to look up to. You've made me want to be a better pony. But at the same time, you were too good. You were an impossible standard. Tonight, you've made it easier for me to live with myself. I curled up against Velvet Remedy, burying my face in her dress. Applejack was put in charge of the Ministry of Wartime Technology because she was the bearer of one of the elements of harmony, and the rule of Equestria recognized the caliber of that. Do you think it was her virtue and her soul, or the jewelry on her neck, that made Applejack a bearer? The mayor who was soon to replace Steelhoofs continued to speak his words with the reverence they deserved. Today, you must choose with whom your oath lies. Another memory surfaced, filling me with fresh pain for my friend and for all he had lost. It's better that my children never knew me. Steelhoofs had been a haunted pony. The shadows of his past, his sins and mistakes, all pressed down on him. I'm sorry, little Pip. I did everything I could to make them believe taking Stable Two was a mistake. I have been for decades. But after you showed up, and they realized there was still a functional stable down there. I had been so angry with him, even though he had tried his best. Part of me had wanted to kill him on the spot. He didn't resist or fight back. Instead, he had stepped up, become the better pony he had wanted to be. Thank you, Steelhoofs, Zanath had said, for helping my daughter's village. I know it must be hard for an old soldier to help Zebrakin. Applejack would have wanted her rangers to protect all good people, not just ponies. He had struggled with his own prejudice, and was finally beginning to overcome that too. He had taken steps on a path to recovery that he would now never be able to complete. I tried to remember the last thing I heard him say, a warning urging us to move. But the words themselves slipped from my memory. Instead, the actual words I clearly remembered my friend speaking were, The rest of you can go on ahead if you wish, but Applejack would not want her steel rangers to ignore a cry for help. Carry on in his name and in his memory, Crossroads said, concluding her eulogy. There was a pregnant silence, broken only by the wind and the sounds of strange gunfire that continued in the distance, unabated. Is there any pony who wishes to speak? Crossroads offered, the sadness soaking her voice. Before we lower Steelhoofs to his final rest. I pulled myself in Velvet Remedy and focused my magic, rolling forward. She walked beside me as we made our way down to the front. I turned towards the expectant heads of the rangers. I opened my muzzle, but my voice caught in my throat. Another sob shuddered through me. I stared down. Again, Velvet put a steadying hoof on my shoulder. I... I swallowed heavily. I only knew Apple Snack for a short time. But... But I may have known him better than any pony else. He shared things with me. Memories. I stopped. I couldn't continue. 
Instead, I lifted my pit buck infused leg. Velvet Remedy's horn began to glow. I. There's nothing I can say to do him justice. But as Applesnack is lowered, I want to play his song. It was his and Applejack's song. I started the music. Velvet's magic amplified it beautifully, allowing it to carry across the grassy hills, wafting over the pits of sand and out across the lake like a breeze. I want to calm the storm, but the war is in your eyes. How can I shield you from the horror and the lies? When all that once held meaning is shattered, ruined, and bleeding, and the whispers in the darkness tell me we won't survive. As the song played, the knight stepped forward, setting down the platform where Steelhoof's body rested, encased still in his Steel Ranger's armor, adorned with red trim and Applejack's cutie mark painted on the flank. The platform rested over the pit, the poles resting on the edges of the freshly dug earth. All things will end in time. This coming storm won't linger. Why should we live as if there's nothing more? So hold me neath the thunder clouds, my heart held in your hooves. Our love will keep the monsters from our door. The song was only marred by the rumble of distant thunder and the persistent sound of weapons fire. Strawberry Lemonade stepped away, her tear-reddened eyes meeting mine. Then she turned away, looking into the distance. I heard the sharp intake of air as Strawberry Lemonade gasped. I lifted my gaze in the direction she was staring. Far, far away, I could see the mountain range that ran through Equestria, the silhouette of Canterlot jutting from the tallest cliffside, wrapped in a haze of pink that had been slowly bleeding out over the last few days. Dark forms hovered around the city, sparking flashes of colored light. For I know tomorrow will be a better day. Yes, I believe tomorrow can be a better day. A few other rangers were turning to look, although most kept their focus reverently on steel hooves. Against the better judgment of my aching heart, I floated out my binoculars and turned them towards Canterlot. Enclave Raptors. Several of them were firing on the ruins of Canterlot. No. I realized as a spike of disbelief and dread lanced through me. They were firing underneath the city. Goddesses, they couldn't. But even as I thought the words, the reinforced supports beneath the royal city gave away. The city above shifted, white towers cracking and breaking apart as the whole of Canterlot crashed down the mountainside. The rumble echoed over all of the equestrian wasteland almost indistinguishable from the rest of the distant thunder. A black pit swallowed my heart. We'll come back for her, I had promised. Until then, she's safe here. My last promise to steel hooves. And now, I would never be able to keep it. The Enclave had just destroyed the Canterlot ruins, casually killing every pony in Staple City. No. The wind cut into my mane as I stood before the grave marker that one of the ranger ponies had already created. It was a beautiful, stately marker fashioned from a large chunk of polished rose granite that had been scavenged from the Fetlock Chamber of Commerce. Red and gray. Steelhoof's colors. Here rests Elder Steelhoof's Applesnack. Forefather of Applesnack's rangers. Forefather of Applejack's rangers. Steadfast. Enduring unwavering, a true friend. Calamity stood beside me, Velvet Remedy just behind. Saneth should be here, I noted mournfully. Yep, agreed Calamity. She's here in spirit, Velvet Remedy reminded us. I looked down at the base of the gravestone and the special holder that had been fashioned there. Why? She ain't the only one, Calamity said, following my gaze. In that special niche rested the orange statuette with the blonde mane and tail, which I had told Crossroads that she would find in Steelhoof's shack. 
The words be strong were barely visible where the base was set into the granite. His little pony would watch over him forever. The spirit of Applejack would never leave his side. I rolled slowly down the hall of Stable 29, my thoughts filled with shadows and regrets and pain. I'd failed Steelhoofs. He was dead, and I had failed him. He'd only asked one thing of me. He'd asked me to save just one pony. Instead, I had left Star Sparkle and Canterlot, and now she was dead. I wondered if the Enclave even knew they had wiped out a village of ponies. If they had bothered to check before they started their attack. If they even cared. I reached the end of the hall and looked up at the lit banner above the door. Vinyl scratch. I lifted a hoof and clopped it against the door. Velvet? A voice drifted from inside. I want to be alone. Velvet, please. I knew she was taking the loss of steel hooves hard, but I had really begun to worry when Calamity had told me she had locked herself in Vinyl Scratch's room. It's time for us to go. I said I wanted to be alone. She shouted from behind the door, making me flinch. Velvet. Something was wrong. Even more wrong than I knew. Don't tell me. Velvet, please, talk to me. I heard the door unlock. The metal slid away with a pneumatic hiss. Velvet Remedy was standing there, looking wrecked, a cross expression on her face. Her horn was glowing. You don't want to talk to me right now, little Pip. Now go. I focused, beginning to roll inside. She telekinetically threw something at me, hitting me in the chest. I looked down at the object which had bounced off of me and fallen into my lap. It was a box of memory orbs. Steelhoof's memory orbs. You knew, Velvet said firmly, but surprisingly without accusation. Calamity told me that much, but I didn't realize Steelhoof's knew too. All of you did. Oh, goddesses. No. She'd looked at his memories. She'd seen him dying on the battlefield the day that Fluttershy first tested the mega spells. Velvet, I began, only to find there was nothing no. I could possibly say. Why did this have to happen now? I'm sorry. Just go. I choked. I, I was, I was trying. I, I should have told me. She questioned, a pained smirk crossing her muzzle. I know why you didn't. You were trying to spare me the truth. Trying to save me. And others, I suspect. That's what you do, isn't it? There was something in her voice that I deeply disliked. I had been fearing this day for weeks, sure that the truth about Fluttershy's role in the end of things would devastate Remedy. But I was expecting rage, screaming. Not this. Fluttershy, she made a mistake. I offered, wanting to tell Velvet that the Mega Spell bombs weren't really Fluttershy's fault, that all the death and destruction shouldn't be laid at her idol's hooves, that it was okay to still love Fluttershy. She created... Fluttershy created something beautiful. Velvet Remedy injected sternly, brooking no room for argument. The only mistake she made was that she gave it to any pony. That... Well, I should be relieved to hear her saying that, right? So why wasn't I? Now, if you'll excuse me, I want to be alone, she said gravely. I don't think I can travel with you any more. What? I breathed. What? My wounded heart breaking. I couldn't lose another friend. No! Not now. No! But why? Velvet Remedy huffed, becoming truly cross. You really want to leave, Little Pip. Before I say something, we will both regret. She began to walk away, trying to close the door behind her. Why? It refused to shut, sensing that I was in the way. 
but... Velvet Remedy spun, stomping. Fluttish Eye's mistake was giving the Mega Spells to other ponies. She created magics of life and healing. How could I not love her for that? She glared. But it was beyond naive to think she could give Mega Spells to anyone without them being turned into something horrible. I fought to respond, but my brain wasn't working. I felt paralyzed as I watched one of my dearest friends seem to self-destruct. Oh, I understand why she thought other ponies would use the spells for good. I've been just as stupid. I've spent all my life wanting to help ponies because I've held on to this idiotic, naive belief that, deep inside, we're all inherently good, that we deserve to be helped, to be saved. Her words were giving me unpleasant flashbacks to Mr. Topaz. We... we are basically good. Velvet Remedy laughed a broken, nasty laugh. Haven't you been paying attention, little Pip? She scolded. Did you somehow miss Arbu? How about Fluttershy's cottage? Or every other damn thing we've seen? She shook her head. No. Deep inside, we're all raiders. My muzzle hung open. No, that's not true, Velvet. I knew Velvet Remedy was hurting. I prayed this was her pain speaking. I couldn't bear to see her like this. No, she countered. Even the best of us fall to evil at the drop of a hat. Do you know what the worst thing I've ever done in my life was? I suspected she was about to bring up killing the raiders in Fluttershy's home. But she surprised me. It was when I tried to use you to make Calamity jealous. I knew you loved me. And I... She lowered her head. It was horrible. What I tried to do was cruel and unkind. I didn't deserve forgiveness. I wanted to reach out and hug her, to hold her. But I forgave you, I told her softly. We all have moments of... Evil? She interrupted. That's the point, little Pip. Hell, you're probably the most selfless, noble pony in the wasteland. And look what you've done. We're attending Steelhoof's funeral because you decided to set off a mega spell in their den. I reeled as if she had bucked me. Honestly, I know you think of them as just monsters. And I even know why you had to do it. The goddess was a threat to everyone and everything. But you were up there home to get to her, little Pip. Oh, goddesses. You massacred all those monster families with their little monster children. Her tone was sad Please and without malice. Please but each no. word slammed into me with the force of a sledgehammer. Honestly, what did you expect them to do? Roll over? Play dead? She looked directly into my eyes. Steelhoofs is dead because of what you did. My whole body went numb. And the worst part is that it was the right thing to do. All of this. Steel of death. It was all my fault. No, oh, please. And you? You're the best of us, little Pip. She reached up and pushed me out of the doorway with a hoof. I'm not coming with you, little Pip. I can't help save the wasteland if I can't believe the ponies in it are worth saving. The metal door slid shut between us. I fell out of my wheelchair and curled up on the floor, hurt beyond the telling of it. Finally, the tears came. And they wouldn't stop. Calamity came looking for me. I didn't want to move.
Sorry. I needed a moment. I just wanted to die. I did this. I did this. I moaned, unable to cry anymore. Now you stop that right now, you hear, Calamity ordered. You risked your own life and nearly lost it to saving the equestrian wasteland from one of the biggest threats I could imagine. You're a big damn hero, and I won't stand for none of this self-pity. That bomb killed... how many? Hellhounds. Pegasi. How many unintended dead? Just to take out the goddess. I imagined even Red Eye would be appalled at how I had discarded my morals. Way I see it, you saved every pony, Calamity told me. And it weren't your fault the damn Enclave showed up when they did. No pony could have predicted that. How about the Hellhounds? Calamity nickered. Oh, damn it, Velvet. He stomped. The Hellhounds are nothing but murderous territorial monsters who kill ponies indiscriminately. They have been for centuries. Y'all save countless lives by wiping so many of them out. He was right. But that didn't stop me from thinking of magical dragon's fire burning away monster families filled with helpless screaming children. Let's go get you well, little Pip. I blinked, looking up at him. You're coming with me? I was actually surprised when the Pegasus nodded. I wanted to stay with Velvet, be here for her, Calamity told me, flapping his wings in discomfort. But y'all need to get to Manhattan, and it ain't safe for y'all to travel alone. A sick heroine and a ghoul merchant? He shook his head. She'll be hurting something fierce, but if I don't come along, I reckon y'all might not make it. And I ain't aiming to lose any more friends this week. Manhattan. Homage. My heart was bleeding out. I'm going to say this now. I'm not like Calamity at all. Like, personality-wise. I couldn't... I wouldn't be able to do what he's doing now. Leave someone I love just to help help a friend. I couldn't do... To help my friend out like that. I, I'd be honest. I'm flawed that way. Yes. Boz... I'm not even going to mention it. My, if I couldn't leave my wife to help somebody like the way he's doing it, I couldn't leave my wife like that. I couldn't. I don't think a lot of people wouldn't either. I needed her so badly, but the idea of seeing her again filled me with dread. How could she possibly want anything to do with me after all I had done? After what I had become? Calamity leaned down and gave me a little nuzzle. I especially don't want to lose my first one. I felt a brush of warmth against my bleak, dying heart. Thank you. I... I'm sorry for pulling you away from her. Yeah, well, from what I gather, y'all have given her more help than I could. If there's any way out of the darkness she's in right now, those little statue thingers are the best guys she could hope for. Sometimes, my Pegasus friend was startlingly wise. Calamity and I huddled together in the back of the delivery wagon, clad in anti-radiation barding. Our ghoul friend had smiled broadly as she produced the second suit from the back of the wagon, this one tailored for a Pegasus stallion. I was beginning to think that Dizzy Doo really did carry absolutely everything we might need. Calamity had strapped his battle saddle on over the anti-radiation barding, foregoing his normal armor. Even with the barding, we were having to consume Radaway at least once an hour. Calamity didn't have to be in here with me, but he insisted. I was both thankful and annoyed with him for it. Calamity didn't want to risk taking the Sky Bandit into Manhattan. Crossroads had confirmed reports of a lot of Enclave operating within the city. So, we would either have to go in on Hoof, or in Ditsy Doo's wagon. The trip shouldn't take more than a few hours. We were going to stop at Ten Pony first, drop me off, then Calamity was going to go with Ditsy Doo to Friendship City. If Amage would still have me, I hoped to spend a week wrapped in her embrace. 
Oh, pony feathers, Calamity said, looking up from our fourteenth game. Best of the thirty-nine. I was beginning to suspect that he was letting me win. Really, no pony could be this bad at tic-tac-toe. I felt the wagon slow. Oh, hell, Calamity spat, as two enclave pegasi shot past the wagon and yawed, circling back towards us. Halt, Pegasus! One of them called out, her armor magnifying her voice and altering it with an intimidating reverb. I dent it. Great leaders, what the hell is that thing? Not good. And then the shooting began. They're shooting at us? I gasped. The two enclave pegasi had opened fire on Ditsy Doo. The wagon went into an abrupt dive. Calamity and I tumbled against the wall of the wagon, along with several crates. One, containing dozens of packets of Radaway, spilled open, scattering glowing orange packets everywhere. Several fell through the window that looked out the front of the wagon. I pulled myself to the window and peeked out as the wagon began to pull up, twisting as Ditsy Doo made a hard turn, weaving through the piers of Luna Line. Smoke curled off a hole in her lead barding just behind her left wing, glowing ichor seeping from her wounded flesh more energy shots fired. Above me, part of the roof glowed, a hole the size of a foal disintegrating away. I floated out little Macintosh, pushing myself onto a toppled crate till I could see one of the attacking pegasi through the opening. I slid into sats. Calamity launched himself out of the back of the wagon, taking wing as I fired several shots into the black carapace of the Enclave soldier. Two of the bullets glanced off of the armor, but the third penetrated. I ducked back down, needing to reload with either armor-piercing or magical bullets. Another shot, and the wagon shifted again, all of the crates sliding towards the open rear gate as Ditsy Doo tried to gain altitude. I cast out a levitation net, trying to keep Ditsy Doo from losing all the wear she was carrying. A bolt of magical energy flew into the wagon, striking one of the metal boxes and melting it, destroying whatever had been inside. I could hear Calamity's battle saddle firing. Deadshot Calamity. I was sure he hit his mark. One of the Enclave Pegasi was swooping in right behind us. The gems in her battle saddle crackled, glowing brighter as the Pegasus switched to more powerfully charged sparkle packs. I lifted little Macintosh, my targeting spell allowing me to lock onto the Pegasus's head. I hadn't had time to swap bullets, but if I could hit the visor, I was sure my shot would go through. I was thrown back violently as Ditsy Doo suddenly came to a complete stop. The chasing Pegasus tried to pull up, but slammed jarringly into the back of the wagon's roof. We started moving again as the black carapace-clad Pegasi dropped to the ground, unconscious. I was cleaning up the crates, levitating them in order when Calamity flew back in. Sorry, little Pip, but I couldn't bring myself to kill the fellow, he said, his muzzle etched in a grimace. I grounded him with a shot through the wing, but we're likely to have more trouble from that lot. He looked away. I used to be one of them soldiers. I understood what he was saying. You want to talk about it? Calamity shook his head. Not right yet. Let's get you better first, he said, looking for time. But, yeah, I reckon I'm going to have to talk about this, and sooner rather than later. Oh, it just keeps getting better, I groaned, as we spotted the Enclave Array on top of Tempony Tower. Ditsy Doo veered away, looking for a safe place to land, some place out of sight. We would have to approach Tempony on hoof. Or, more precisely, I would. The Enclave presence in Tempony meant that this was no place for either of my Pegasi friends. A memory resurfaced. Open it back up! Ambrosia had yelled ordering me as the antenna-like weapons of her battle saddle had glowed threateningly. You open this room right now, or I swear by the council I'll teach you what it's like to melt. I couldn't. I had tried to reason with her. I'm just as trapped as you are. This room can only be opened from the outside. And, based on the videos I had seen on my first trip to Maripony, only by the goddess. That was all. Just a flash. 
a fragment of those thirty-plus minutes I was missing. Ditsy Doo landed in the darkened mouth of a crumbling chariot wash. She unhitched herself from the wagon, digging a healing potion out of the mailbag slung on her side. Ditsy Doo, Calamity, can you wait here for me? I asked plaintively. Just a few hours, in case I can't get in, or in case something goes wrong. In case Amlish kicks me out. Ditsy Doo nodded swiftly, then dropped her chalkboard and wrote a single word. Muffins? I smiled. If I can get Amish to make some, absolutely. A few minutes later, I was walking through the rubble towards Tempony Tower. The building seemed much more imposing from street level. You know, towered upwards. The I'm going to say this now, to, build... uh, to be off topic here. Tempony Tower is the same thing as Tempony Tower, right? That's the, that's the joke on it? Which is ironic, because Tempany Tower is an evil place. Because in order to actually gain residence there, you have to blow up... Oh, I'm so sorry. Excuse me. You have to blow up Megaton. In, in the game, that's what you have to do to get residence there. It's the only way to do it. Holding anywhere close to its size, rising out of the graveyard of Manhattan like a lighthouse serving as both a beacon and a warning. My hooves trod between emptied cans of food, old campfires, and a dozen other reminders that part of Red Eye's army had camped around this tower, cutting it off from the rest of the equestrian wasteland and threatening to destroy it with a balefire bomb. The very same balefire bomb I had talked Red Eye into sending to Splendid Valley so I could use it to kill the goddess and destroy the Black Book. And to kill countless others including steel hooves, in the act of it. The thought clawed at my heart. The little pony in my head wept silently. I stopped, leaning against a giant S, one of the more intact letters which had come crashing down from the face of the building. I wasn't breathing right. I wanted to collapse again, and I couldn't tell if it was from the sorrow threatening to overwhelm me, or the weakness that was racking my body. They felt like one and the same at the moment. Ahead, I saw the main entrance to Tempony Tower had been armored over. The whole lower floors were barricaded with a yard of magically fused rubble. The only way in, other than the roof, was through the four-star station above me. I had known this, of course, but it didn't make the idea of levitating up to the station any less exhausting. I looked upwards and saw the black insectoid form of an armored enclave soldier striding across one of the tracks above me. With a flick of my hoof, I turned on the MG Stealth Buck 2 and became invisible. What do you mean she's not here? I cried as I followed Life Bloom. Life Bloom led me through the secret parts of Tempony Tower. What? Places that neither the citizens of the tower nor its new armored clad guests knew of. I mean just that, little pip, Life Bloom affirmed. The Enclave shut down her broadcast. Apparently they have the ability to override whatever any of the rest of us are doing with these towers. But it'll still be my project, right? Rainbow Dash had asked. It'll still be the Ministry of Awesome. The Enclave didn't control the central hub for the single Pegasus project, but they controlled who knew how many Ministry of Awesome hubs above the clouds. And Rainbow Dash had assured that the Ministry of Awesome had overriding authority. I knew my homage. She wouldn't stand for being shut down. She would see the truth got out if it killed her. When did she leave? I asked, worried more for her now than I had been when Tempony Tower faced Red Eye's bomb. That, at least, I had been in a position to prevent. Yesterday morning, just a few hours after they took control of the airwaves, Life Bloom told me as we reached the chamber where he would purge the taint still trapped in my body. She took a bunch of those override devices like the one she gave you for the Philadelphia Tower. She said she had an idea. <sighs> you go, homage. I whispered, wanting to cheer for her, despite all of my worries and fears. Oh, boy. Well, I guess that's it for this episode, guys. Um. Well, 
Anyway, guys, this was a very big doozy episode, and I'm looking forward for the store, the this coming storm part two, guys, which is the, which, oh boy, guys, I cannot wait. There was a lot that happened in this episode, and, I, and I'm sorry for the emotional scene you guys saw, but I did love this chapter. It had a lot to it. Well, anyway, guys, I'll catch you guys later, and stay nerdy, my friends. Bye.